Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you, Mona. A, for calling me young. Um, and B, for just kind of that introduction. It just, it blesses me and Zolly to be a part of this body like you would not believe. Um, we do have a testimony. I share it as often as I can. And he's still writing our testimony. There's still a lot to be shared. So um, I, I just endeavored when I started coming here and getting plugged in. Um, the Lord was very clear. You just say yes. Even when you don't want to, you just say yes. If the church asks you to do it, you're going to say yes. And so that's really been the journey. Like everything they've asked, like, yes, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm doing it. I'm certainly not equipped to do it, um, but God, right? And so I said yes, and then, you know, here I am. I, I don't even know how this happens, right? I don't even know how I'm even up here tonight, but I, I will say that I do have a word um, that I believe is very much for this body. Um, it's something that he has been just unfolding to me over the course of several months. And so I think if you guys will just join me and pull back from me and, and participate. I love participation. Um, I do a lot of teaching and training, and, and I, I will call you out. So if I feel like you're sleeping, I'm probably going to make you get up on stage and read a Bible verse or something. It's just in me. So stay awake, okay? Stay with me, all right? But I just want to go to the Lord in prayer before we get started, invite the Holy Spirit in to move, and then we'll get going. So thank you so much, Lord, for tonight and the opportunity to just come and sit in your presence. Lord, I know that the Holy Spirit has a word for, for the church tonight, and I just pray that, that your word come forth, that it isn't my word, it's not anybody else's word, but yours, Lord, because it's what brings freedom. So I just thank you for your assistance. I thank you for your presence tonight. And I just thank you for this opportunity. I don't take it for granted. And I just love you very much. In most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So before we get started, I want to lay a foundational, fundamental truth that I need you guys to understand before I get into tonight's topic. And Pastor Nate talked about it on Sunday, and I almost was like, hey, you need to stop because I feel like you're still in a little bit of my thunder, but I'll let him keep going, so you're welcome, <laughs> Pastor Nate, if you're watching. <laughs> but this foundational truth that we need to understand is that the devil is not a creator, but God is, and so are we. Right. So I'm going to say that again because I need you to get it. The devil is not a creator, but God is... And so are we. And if you don't believe me, if you guys will put up John 1, 3. I tried to take everything back to the word because this isn't my word. It's not my opinion. It's his. John 1, 3 says, all things were made and came into existence through him. And without him, not even one thing was made that has come into being. So we see that God creates all things. And I'm laying this as a truth before we get into tonight's message because I'm going to trust that everyone in this room is going to go back and study out what I'm going to say. No matter what word or platform you hear it from, you have to confirm it in the word for yourself. And so I'm going to trust that you're going to do that. And when you do, you have to know this truth that God created all things the devil is not a creator. We, we like to think sometimes that we're like stuck in the middle, like we're in this tug of war with good and bad. And the devil created all things bad and God created all things good. And we're just in the middle and we're victims of the circumstance. Well, there is nothing that the devil created. Are y'all getting it? Okay, that means I can have victory over anything because when I partner with God, we are victorious and the devil has no power in our life. He can't create anything that we don't create with partnership with him. It's a choice, okay? So I need you guys to get that before I get into anything else. So I need like a, like a woohoo or a head nod or something. Yeah, yeah, I like participation, remember? All right, so tonight's topic... The title is Identity Crisis. So if you're taking notes, if you're not taking notes, the title is still Identity Crisis. <laughs> All right. And I think if we look at our America, because that's what we have a perspective for, right? 
Um, I think we can all tonight agree that we're kind of in some rough shape as far as our identity comes. Like, we are not even America anymore. We're America, right? We're America. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, America. I didn't even say that right. Uh. But it's pretty obvious that our nation is kind of in a lot of confusion. I mean, the very basics of what we think we should know about our physical makeup is under question. Um, Things that just seem like basic, that we should know this, are up for debate. Our, Our foundation as a country is often being questioned. So we're surrounded by a lot of just people, culture, things that are really confused. There's a lot of blurry lines, a lot of gray playing field. And I think as the church, especially in a church that's taught really well, we can often think, well, look at them. You know, they're, they're a hot mess. So we're okay because we know who we are. We know who our God is. We're taught well. And so we have some, some things that, there's some things that set off in us that are obvious to us that we can guard against that we recognize as the enemy. But I want to take tonight and I want to talk to the church. And I want you to know that that's a dangerous place to be. To think that I don't deal with that. Because it's not true. And the people in the church battle the same things that the world battles. Just sometimes we're wiser or we're better at hiding it. So... I just, I want to walk you through it. I don't want to get up here and glorify all the things that the devil does. But I think that we have to walk into his war room sometimes. And we have to identify his strategy. And we have to say, no. Right? It's not about like, oh, look what all he can do. But I do want to walk you through some strategies tonight. And draw some attention and some exposure on some things that maybe we aren't putting guards up against. Maybe we aren't, yeah, that's for them. Not necessarily for me, because I know better, right? I'm taught well, I'm, I'm planted in the church, and I know better. But I think we have to be careful, okay? All right. All right, so we said that God's the creator, the devil's not. If you guys look at Genesis, Genesis 2.18, so we're going to go back to creation. We're gonna look at, We're going to look at God's intention for man. So the only part of creation that God looked at and said that's not good was when he looked down and he saw that man was alone. He said, now the Lord God said it is not good, sufficient, satisfactory that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, suitable, adapted, complimentary for him. So what do we see here? We see that we need relationship. So there's a God-given desire in our heart to have and to seek relationship. If you put up 1 Corinthians 12, 18, if you guys will turn with me there. It says, but as it is, God has placed and arranged the limbs and organs in the body, each particular one of them, just as he wished and saw fit and with the best adaptation. So we were created for relationship and we were created to belong in a body. So we have a place, we have a people We have a tribe. You guys ever heard that? Find your tribe. It's God's intention that we would do that. And then if you'll put up Ephesians 1, 4. It says, even as in his love, he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy, consecrated, and set apart for him and blameless in his sight, even above reproach, Before him in love. Thank you. So we were created for relationship. We were created to belong in a body. And we have a purpose. That's God's intention for his children. Okay. Now what the devil does do. Is the devil manipulates the things that God created. To get us a little bit off track. And sometimes it's just a little bit. And so I wanted to point this out because I need you to see that God created us to want to find our people, to to fit in, to find where we belong. It is completely okay that we seek relationship. 
that we not be out on our own, that we do have a place to fit in and we do have a purpose. And I think when we look at the world, we're like, oh, they're lost because they just don't know who they are. I got to go find myself. How many times have you heard that? I got to go find myself, right? Well, it's a God given like hole in our heart to go and find where we belong but his intention is what that we go to the body that we find relationship and connection in the body and that we find our purpose and our purpose is that we would help other people purpose always comes back to people it's never a self-seeking thing i don't exist for myself i exist for others okay so it's important to see how God created this desire in our heart, yet it can get manipulated in our life's quest to find where we fit in, right? It's almost taboo to think, well, you can't fit in. You have to, you know, you have to be different. Or, you know, we, we, just, we just seek these weird things, and we just need, we need to find our place in the body. That's really what we're seeking, okay? But on that life mission to find our place... Again, I'm talking to the church tonight, but this is a strategy that he has for all men, whether you're in the church or not. The devil comes with very particular strategies, and they're typically pretty, pretty subtle. We don't recognize them. So I want to put some light on them tonight because I think it's important that we recognize some of these subtleties. So the first strategy I want to talk about is culture. And if you guys were here last Wednesday, Pastor Susan talked a little bit about culture and how it changes. And I think she referenced um, the frog in the water. And so when I talk about culture, I'm, I'm really talking about like this, this atmosphere that we exist in. Who grew up in the South? Okay, so a few of you didn't. When you all moved here, the ones that did not grow up in the South, were there some cultural things, Matt? He's giving me like a, yeah. There was some things that you have to, you know, adapt to a little bit in culture. So culture in and of itself is not a bad thing. In fact, when I'm doing training for, for leadership in, in my Walmart world, I talk a lot about culture. I talk a lot in regards to clean and how we lead our team. And if you're going to let a broom sit in this corner and not put it away, then are you establishing a culture? A culture says, I see it, I do it, I adapt to it. Okay? Well, again, not necessarily a bad thing, but it can be a subtle attack of the enemy, and it often is. So like the frog in the water, if you've heard that analogy before, a frog can be in a pot of water. You can turn it up to boil. And the frog will never jump out because it doesn't feel the heat rising. It's slow. It's not, an, like, it's not obvious. The body temperature of the frog is changing with the water, and eventually it dies. And a lot of culture seeps into the church and has a very similar effect. So if you look at Proverbs 14, 12, it tells us there's a way which seems right to man and appears straight before him, but its end is the way of death. So I think that's exactly the frog analogy. Would you agree? Like it seems right. It feels like, yeah, it's just kind of all I've ever known. And so it feels okay. Like I'm not going to guard against some of this stuff. I don't take it to the word to confirm some of the things I'm hearing. And so I just begin to adapt very slowly to my culture. And I start carrying things that I didn't know. And those are seeds. They're seeds planted. May not be an immediate, you know, death. But it is a slow death if we don't recognize it as dangerous. And then another strategy that he uses is... Opinions. Oh. Yes. So whether they be ours or somebody else's, okay, opinions come from our thought process. Again, opinions are not inherently bad. God gave us free will to think for our own self and come up with our own choices which then translates to opinions. 
And if we're seeking the Lord, our opinions really aren't ours, but they're His. They're His words in our mouth, therefore we can have victory. But when it's the world's or the enemy's partnership or words in our mouth, then it can destroy us. And we hear opinions from others, and you start to hear yourself say stuff like, I can see that. Like, I can see where in that situation that that would be the right decision. Or I can see in this scenario that that, that makes sense. And we, we take logic and we apply it, and now it creates our opinion. Rather than checking our logic to what we know in our heart because it's in the word and verifying that it's right. And so, again, opinions are seeds that are planted in our life if we don't have a guard up for it. And if you turn to Proverbs 18.2, it kind of tells us some thoughts on opinions. I just want to share it because I really like this verse. A self-confident fool has no delight in understanding, but only in revealing his personal opinions in himself. So we have to check ourselves because church... Sometimes we use the word to express an opinion, and that is dangerous. So you have to check yourself. Is the word helping others? Is my opinion to further someone else and God's agenda, or is it mine? Because let me tell you, God doesn't need us to defend him. We don't have to go and defend God. He defended us. We have to align with God. We have to say what he says. And we have to check ourselves before we say our opinion. And make sure that it isn't just for our agenda but for his. And his agenda is what? People. People. Okay? Not ourselves. All right, and the third strategy I want to talk about is desires of the flesh. So we've established culture, plant seeds. We've established opinions can plant seeds, subtle attacks, nothing coming at you really quick. And now you have the desires of the flesh. And if you'll put up Galatians 5, 17 through 21, I want to, I want to take some time to break this verse apart for you. For the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh. For these are antagonistic to one another, continually withstanding in conflict with each other, so that you are not free, but are prevented from doing what you desire to do. But if you are guided or led by the Holy Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Pay attention there. Now the doings, the doings or practices of the flesh are clear, obvious. They are immoral, immorality, impurity, indecency, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, ill temper, selfishness, division, dissensions, party, party spirit, faction, sex, sex with peculiar opinions. There's that word again. Envy, drunkenness carousing, and the like. I warn you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's important. Our inheritance is on the line. So I want to break this down because I need you to see this, and I'm going to unfold it the way that God unfolded it to me. If I am led by the flesh, I am under the law. If I am led by the Spirit, I am free in grace. They oppose one another, so one has to be stronger than the other. The Bible tells me I have to crucify my flesh, which means I have to lay down these desires, and I have to seek the Lord. This is a choice, you guys, and inheritance hangs in the balance of your choice, meaning what God, my Father, has given me as an inheritance hangs in the balance of this very choice. Am I going to be under the law, which is bondage, okay? 
You need to see that too because it's important and we'll come back around to that. But it's bondage. It's not freedom to live of the flesh. It is bondage. Being led by the spirit is freedom. It doesn't feel like that sometimes. But that is what the word tells us, right? And then church, sometimes we like to take these desires of the flesh and we like to like categorize them. Like which ones are worse than the other ones, you know? We're like, oh yeah, orgies, those are real bad. <laughs> okay. But envy, yeah, it's not so bad. Jealousy, you know. Everybody has jealousy. Strife, yeah, it's just part of life, you know? Everybody, everybody kind of fights and bickers. It, it is what it is. But, but adultery, mm, drunkenness, now those, yeah. But it's not separated here. This is all one desire, right? It's a flesh desire. And I have to choose between one or the other. So don't get yourself caught up in the culture of deciding which one is worse. Because see how that's a culture thing that says which one is worse than the other. They're all weighted the same. And you have to choose. All right? So culture, opinions. Desires of the flesh. These are all strategies that the enemy uses to attack people. Because he knows if I can steal their identity, I can keep them out of their place in the body. I can keep them out of purpose. And those people that they are destined to reach in their life will never be reached. So I know I don't have victory over this whole battle, but I can win these tiny little battles. And I can take as many people with me as I can if I can get the church to not recognize who they are. And so it's subtle. They're not, it doesn't, they, he knows better than to come at a church like this with something obvious. Okay? And if we think that we're immune, you're not because I've seen people in this body detached from this body where they were flourishing and thriving and doing really well and now you can hardly even recognize them we're not immune we're not immune we have to stay on guard and let me show you how the enemy gets at the church the most okay so you guys remember i said that we are made for relationship we are positioned in a part of the body right we have a purpose. We see the enemy comes with subtleties in culture, opinions, and he uses the, the flesh desires that we have against us. Okay? So I'm talking to the church right now. I'm talking to the Wednesday night crew. Not even just the church. I'm talking to the Wednesday nighters. The ones that are in their place, that know the importance of being here, that show up, defied all odds to be here. I'm talking to y'all. Okay? Because this is really important. So, culture, opinions, right? We get all that. So, I'm in my place. I'm in the body. I'm thriving. I'm doing well. So, what is it, if I know better, I'm taught better, what is it that gets me detached? Shame. Shame can detach me from the place I'm supposed to be connected. And I'll show you how. So I said these are all seeds, right? And you can't avoid these seeds because they're being spewed like a machine gun everywhere you go. Whether it's in, in, you know, on social media or at work. Like, there's seeds coming at you everywhere. And so we are on guard. We're taught well in this church to stay on guard. But at some point, some seeds are going to get into your soil. Okay? We're going to miss something subtle. There's going to be something... In here, and so we're connected in the body and we're doing great. And then some of these seeds begin to sprout something, so we see a little weed pop up out of the ground, and we're like, Oh, I'm in my tribe, and my tribe's gonna reject me because I've been manipulated to think that I have to have your approval rather than confidence in where God placed me. And so, if the people around me begin to reject me, then I'm going to be pushed out of the tribe and now I don't have my place anymore. You see how fear of man creates shame? And so now I have this little, this little weed that pokes up and so I pull it really quick because I cannot let the church people see my weeds. 
I got to stomp it down. I got to pull it up really quick because I don't want them to see it because they might reject me because I know there's something not right about it and maybe I really like it because it feels good to the flesh or maybe I just don't understand my point of view or my perspective and so I try to hide it. Okay? And so we do that every time we see something like pop up that maybe maybe somebody else might see and we don't want them to see it. So... What does that do to your soil? Well, if you guys have ever had a garden, you know it's important to tend your garden. But when you tend your garden, you have to get to the roots. You have to get down. You have to pull it. You have to reset that soil if it's close to the plant that's going to produce a harvest. Okay? So when those seeds pop up, I'm stomping them down. They're going to be intertwined with some of the good seed. And now my soil is compromised, which means now I'm kind of exposed. My fruit can't grow to its capacity because my soil's not so great anymore because I keep pushing it down and I'm trying to hide something, okay? And so now I go to church, pastor gets on stage, and he says something I don't like. And now I'm like, oh, that kind of hurt a little bit. Yeah, I'm not, mm, I don't know about that, Pastor. Then I don't go back to the Word. Because remember when I told you that any platform or any person needs to go back to the Word regardless of who it is. And I don't go back to the Word. I just, it kind of, it dings. And what that probably was was the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you got some bad seed. You need to confirm some stuff. You need to dig in a little bit. But we don't do that. We just get mad. And so now I'm looking, I'm looking for the next person to not say hi to me, or when I go to the small group, they don't really accept me like I think that they should, or my friend didn't invite me to this thing that they were invited to, and now I'm looking for reasons because I'm feeling like I have to hide who I am to the people that I'm supposed to be connected to, and now I'm offended. So where does that put me? Well, maybe this isn't my tribe. Maybe this isn't my place. Maybe I got it all wrong. So I'll try this other church. We'll, we'll do some church hopping because we're not like quick to just give up Jesus. You know? We're not. We're like, we, we love him. He's good to us. You know, we've been flourishing. It's just those people. It's just those people. And so now we're out and we're searching for our tribe. And let me tell you something. If you want to find people who will accept you in all your weeds, go find it in the world. Because they will gladly take you in and say, your weeds are just fine with me. So what happens then is we, we disconnect. And then we find our new tribe that tells us, hey, it's okay. I'm the same. I feel the same. I think the same. It's normal. Okay? It's normal. And, and, and it's okay. Look, at, look around you. And they start pointing out things. And so now you're like, man, maybe I really was in the wrong place because these people love me. Yeah, they get me. I, this is where I belong. And so then we just, those weeds, they just grow. And it feels good to just not have to pluck those weeds anymore. It feels good just to let that grow. But what happens in a garden when I let the weeds grow? There is no harvest. And so my very purpose is to produce harvest for other people. And now I'm only self-absorbed and letting those weeds grow. And I'm feeling real good about it. But my life's purpose is snuffed out. And now I'm only focused on myself. I'm only looking for myself. And I'll look up eventually because these other people who are letting all their weeds grow, who love me so much don't really love me so much anymore because we can't even see each other amongst all the weeds, you know? Now I'm, I'm by myself and I'm thinking, well, who am I? Because I've worn this identity that said, this is who I am now. This is who I am and you need to accept me because this is who I am. And we start declaring things as truth over our life that contradict God's word over our life and now we are separated remember when I said the things of the flesh put me under the law and the things of the spirit put me under grace 
and my inheritance is on the line. Now I've been over here wallering in my own weeds, and I'm under the law, so I better be ready to make some atonement for my sins if I want to continue this way. Read some Old Testament if you don't know what I'm talking about. If you're under the law, there's a lot of work to be done to get to be back into relationship with God. But under grace, oh, that's freedom. That's freedom. True freedom. So what do we do? We have these seeds. Can't really control them. So go to 2 Corinthians 4.2. Kind of feels like, Miranda, you're telling me I'm a victim here. Kind of feels like I can't help the seeds that are planting and these weeds are going to pop up anyway. And you're telling me that I can't expose those in church and I have to go find the people in the world who like all my weeds. <laughs> uh, all right, 2 Corinthians 4.2 says, We have renounced disgraceful ways, our secret thoughts, feelings, desires, and underhandedness, the methods and arts that men hide through shame. We refuse to deal craftily, to practice trickery and cunning, or to, do, or to adulterate or handle dishonestly the word of God. But we state the truth openly, clearly and candidly. And so we commend ourselves in the sight and presence of God to every man's conscience. So you're telling me I have to expose my weeds? Yeah. That's exactly what I'm telling you you need to do. I'm saying you got to take it to the word. And you got to take it to your tribe. You have to. Because if I'm just going to hide it from the people who can give me the word of truth that will set me free then I can't exist and I will find people who will accept all of this stuff, but I can't flourish in my purpose for life. The very reason I exist is to have relationship, to be in the body, and for a purpose. Purpose is people. I can't do any of that stuff if I disconnect and I'm off over here pursuing the things that are selfish. I can't. So I have a story um, and I didn't tell my husband I was going to share this, so you're welcome. You're welcome. So he and I, um, we met and we, we smoked cigarettes, just to clarify. I've said a lot about weeds tonight. I just want to make sure everyone knows. Uh, anyway, so I quit. I just, I put them down. I just was done with them. I smoked for 12 years. It wouldn't do it anymore. Um, it was pretty easy for me to, you know, partner with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't, it wasn't a lot of labor for me. I just decided I wanted to do it, and so I did it. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I quit smoking. He didn't. He, he kept smoking for a while, a uh, few years, several years after I quit. But he didn't want to smoke in front of the kids, and, you know, I respected that. It was great. But, Man, when he didn't have a cigarette, he was kind of mean. I know. He was a little mean. And so I, I didn't want to nag him. I didn't want to be the wife. I, I wanted to wait for him to get that, like, conviction that it was time to stop. But I just got to this point where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be bold. I'm going to say it. He's my husband. He's going to have to take it. <laughs> so I did. I spoke up, and I said, hey, it's time. It's time to put him down. And, you know. He accepted that real well. <laughs> so it was kind of a fight, you know. He didn't really, he didn't really appreciate my my input. I kind of like a fight, so I was like, let's roll. But anyway, um, so it didn't go over well that night. You know, I know we're not supposed to go to bed mad, but we, I think we were kind of mad at each other that night. And uh, but he, I think it was a text or message the next day, and he's like, hey, you're right. And I'm like, say what? No, I'm just teasing. He said, it is time to quit. Um, I, you know, I appreciate what you're saying. Da, da, da. Well, at that time, I don't really even know, like, how. And he's not here tonight. Justin Burrow and him had kind of connected. I think they were doing, like, a run the gauntlet or something. And so they were going to go do this race together. And some, I don't even know how that happened. Like, he doesn't run. 
it, it was totally kind of a God thing. I mean, he's in shape. Like, he, you know, he can do 15 push-ups and have his six-pack back. But um, I don't even know how push-ups get you a six-pack, but they do in my husband's case. So, anyways, they somehow connected. And I remember that uh, he, my husband confided in Justin that he was trying to quit smoking. They weren't even, like, it wasn't a lifelong friendship. He just, he confided in him that he wanted to quit. And Justin didn't spew, like, he didn't preach at him, be like, I can't believe you're smoking, man, because he wasn't obvious about it. Like, y'all probably wouldn't have known. But he confided in someone he felt connected to, and Justin came back with, oh, well, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to quit drinking Coke. He didn't weigh it out and say, yours, yours is worse than mine, but, you know, I'll do you, I'll do you a solid, buddy. He was very clear about, like, hey, we'll do this together. And it wasn't just he said it. It was what he did after that when he texted and said, hey, I didn't have a Coke today. Do you have a cigarette? And he quit smoking. Do you see how exposing something that you're hiding from people now puts it in the limelight for the people who love you and want good things for you will actually talk life and support you in your stuff? That is the church. That is the church. So when our weeds pop up, we have to stop, like, putting them down really quick. We've got to stop hiding them. We can't bask in them, and we can't expect the church to say all the things that make us feel good about them. But we do expect that when we confide in them, that the church comes back with the word of God and out of love to help us overcome it. That's the church. That's the church. So we talked a lot about the the strategies of the enemy. But I haven't spent a lot of time talking about the strategies of God. Because let me tell you, they're way more powerful than the strategies of the enemy. Like we just walked into the war room because his, his door's wide open and he has no new tricks because he's not a creator. He's about as obvious as they come. And so all we did was we turned a light on. This isn't hard. We're just turning a light on. On some of the things that he, he snuck into our life and some of these seeds that he might have planted. It isn't hard. But God's word is what overcomes all things. So when you think about seeds being planted in your life that you don't recognize immediately, we have to go to the Word. We have to stay in the Word because the things that are not obvious attacks against our soul or our spirit, we have to defend even when we don't see it. Which means every day I have to be in the Word. And I may read something today that makes no sense to me. Because it's not for today. Because God knows the seeds that have been planted that are fermenting underground, that are about to sprout up, and he's given you a word to fight against it. He is under the ground doing some work on those roots that have taken place, if you'll stay in his word. So we're going to look at some things that God says. Go to Galatians 3.28. It says, so there is now no distinction, neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is not male or female for all one, for we are all one in Christ. This verse is used out of context to push people's opinions often. Does that, there is no male or female ring any bells to the identity crisis we talked about. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that it's dangerous to wear any other identity outside of I am a child of God. And I'm talking any identity. If you identify as a mother, you're limited to your children. If you identify as a career person, you are limited to your job. If you identify by the opinions of others, you are limited to the opinions of others. If you identify as an American, you are limited to America. Do you see that? 
Even God himself, when Moses said, Who do I say that you are? He said, Say that I am. He didn't even limit himself. I am the great I am. So we got to stop wearing these identities. Good or bad, if they contradict what God says about you. And God says we are one in Christ. I no longer am religious. I am no longer culturally in or out, right? Slave, free, that's a culture time. And then there's the physical identity. I'm no longer male or female. I am in Christ. Now, the other things are a part of our makeup. There's characteristics, there's traits that we have, but it's not our identity. Do you see that? All right, go to um, 1 Peter 2, 9. Oh, I love this one. I'm going to read it from mine. I'm sorry, it might be a little different. So 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal race, priesthood, a consecrated nation, a special people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's talking to the church. I'm talking to the church. You are chosen people. You notice it doesn't say chosen person. You are a royal priesthood. Notice it doesn't say a royal priest this is all referencing the place that we belong the body where we belong and our identity in that i'm chosen i'm royal i'm set apart and i have a purpose and i am god's own possession so going back to i am a child of god i belong to god and with that i am chosen i am royal i am set apart and i have purpose this is what god says that we are this is who you are. John 1, 12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we see that we become, we have the right to be his child. I like to say I had a blood transfusion and now I am actually physically in Christ, I am in the family, I am adopted, I am covered by the blood, I exist in him alone, and I have an inheritance because I am a child. So remember when I said your inheritance is on the line with the choice that you make, flesh or spirit? This is where I find that I have an inheritance. I am a child of the creator of the universe. I am a child of God. I am created in his image to exist for his purpose. And because that is my purpose, I have all the things that he has. Limitless. So when I identify as anything else in the world, I am limited. When I identify as the desires of the flesh, the things that have just always been in there that I don't quite understand, when I identify as that, I'm limited under the law. But when I identify as a child, I now have a child of God. I now have an inheritance and a freedom to be completely limitless. The great I am. I am the child of the great I am. Do you see the beauty in that? Limitless. And then Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. And I read part of this one earlier. But it's so good. Just as in his love he chose us in Christ. Actually selected us for himself as his own. Before the foundation of the world. So that we would be holy. That is consecrated, set apart for his purpose. Driven and blameless in his sight and love. Driven and blameless in his sight and love. He predestined and lovingly planned for us to be adopted to himself as his own children through Jesus Christ. In accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of his will. He picked us. He picked us. He made us for relationship. 
He needs us in a body, and he needs us working towards a purpose. So, yeah, I'm talking to the church tonight. It's time to expose some stuff. It's time to stop snuffing it out because we think the church won't accept it. And it's time to get into the word. So step one, recognize that you're not immune to the seeds. Step two, go before the Lord and say, hey, Daddy, I got to talk to you. I, we got, I need to understand some of these thoughts. I need to understand some of these feelings because, hey, y'all, they're real. Stop pretending like it's something made up. And church, stop telling people that it is. It's real. There's a spiritual battle for each and every single person, and we've got to stop underestimating the impact it has on their life because it's ripping people out of this body. So go to Daddy. Hey, Daddy, I need help. I don't think I can come to the church with this because I think they'll judge me. If you feel like you can't talk to the church about it, then you need to take it to the Father. And you know what the Father's going to do? A, he's going to give you a word. But that word may not come outside of a person. And he's almost always going to send you back to find the Justin Burroughs of the world. Because everything God does, he does through people. And so, yes, he has a word. It's in here. And you can read it. And it will set you free. But until you're actually willing to be bold and expose it to your tribe and the people so that they can actually show them the true love of Christ because that's how the love of Christ is shown is through people, then you may not ever actually accept it as your reality and your identity. We need help from each other. And church, we need to not underestimate it when people bring us their weeds. It's important. It's important. All right, so that's it. I messed up and didn't say I'm closing so that y'all could get ready. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, anyway, I do. I appreciate you guys listening tonight. Um, I, I believe very much that the Lord had that word for a particular uh, person, but I do think it's relevant to the entire body. And so we're just going to close it out in prayer, and then I'm going to hand it over to Miss Mona. So thank you so much, Lord, for, for your word that came forth tonight. We know that when it's your word, it goes forth, and it makes a difference in people's hearts. And so I'm believing that not one person walks out the same as they walked in, and that there is freedom that reigns in their hearts, Lord. And I just expose those places. Expose those places tonight that need to be exposed to your word. And I thank you, Lord, for the people in the word that will come forward and set them free so that they can truly walk in the limitless of what it means to identify as your child of God. And it's in most precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Miranda. Good word. Amen. Amen. So while um, she was teaching there about our weeds and the things we hide, there was a scripture that came to my heart. And it's James 5 and verse 16. And there, a lot of the times I have used this scripture, the second part of it, and it probably sounds very familiar to you that uh, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, right? Um, how many of y'all know what the first part of that scripture says? Confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins, and pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Just exactly what she was talking about. And it reminded me uh, years ago of a, a spiritual leader that I had. He, he called it like this, and I saw it very, um, um, just very strongly work in my life more than once. And he called it drawing a line in the sand, drawing a line in the sand. Because, you know, there's things that we battle with and we hide, like Miranda was talking about. We're battling. We're trying to be better but we're battling it and we are ashamed of it. 
freaked out, right? Uh, we're ashamed of it. And so it's this vicious cycle because we're so aware of it, but we're not getting victory over it. And I have found on multiple occasions in my life. Now, let's be real. We don't get on a, a you know, a um, sound system and blare it out to everybody and their dog. Um, you know, we're wise in who we confide in, right? Uh, but we do. I, I've seen it play out, like I said, multiple times in my life. Just the simple, just simply doing what God says to do. And then there's a grace that comes in that empowers me to overcome what I had been battling in shame by myself. And, and we, need, we need God's grace. Amen? Amen. So um, I want to close out. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings here in, in just a moment. But I do, I want us to read uh, Ephesians. You know, she was talking about identity and you know what are we identifying with and here, here's the truth our human nature makes us want to pal up with people who identify with themselves the same way that I identify with myself we try to flock together like that because somehow if you're like me then I'm justified in being like I am, you know? And um, we will never, we will never be free. We will never be free until we decide that we're not going anywhere else to find out why we are the way we are, who we are, except we identify with who God says that we are. And then I'm not putting pressure on you. I'm not comparing myself to you. I am just free to love you. If I know who I am according to what God says I am. And you know what? God is on the inside of you. How many of you in here are born again? The God of all creation is on the inside of you. And he's got amazing things to say about you. And when I'm thinking on and when I'm saying what he says about me, man, I love you. I love you because I'm not comparing myself to you. I don't have a bad opinion of me. Do, are you following me? And we're so free to love other people. So, uh, hey, we get our chin up and we say what God says about us. Quit Googling quit googling stuff and 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 uh, you know why am I like this why is my personality like this you know <laughs> I'm biting my tongue here um, let God define who we are let God define who we are and not just that we would read it and think on it but we say it like she said we God creates and we create. And the way we create is with the words of our mouth. And if we want to walk in something different than what we've been walking in, then we've got to start talking differently. Amen? Amen. So we're going to say this together in the uh, Amplified. Yeah, I'm doing it now, Adam. Sorry. Uh, Ephesians 1, 17 and um, through 20, 21. But I want us to read this together out loud. Because you know what? We are never going to have the understanding, the, the light on who we are except the Holy Spirit uh, show us. Amen. Amen. All right. So Ephesians 1, 17. We're going to uh, read this out loud, everybody. Um, are we? Oh, we're already there. All right. We're there. Ephesians 1, 17. Let's, uh, let's read. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you spirit of wisdom and revelation of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you 
and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set-apart ones, and so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places 21 far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named above every title that can be conferred not only in this age and in this world but also in the age and the world which are to come I want to skip down uh, I didn't give this to you Adam but I'm going to skip down to chapter 2 and just very quickly here in verse 5 uh, even when we were dead in sins he quickened us together with Christ uh, verse verse um, Oh, I'm going to jump over to the Amplified here. He made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him for. And so I just want to encourage you tonight. This tells us that the same life that God gave Jesus when he raised Jesus from the dead, he gave to you. I think we need to meditate on this a little bit because because this should we should be getting a whole lot of of, of amens and woohoos the very same life that God himself has and that he gave Jesus when he raised him from the dead and he raised him from the dead spirit soul and body the very same life that he gave Jesus then he gave to us glory to God that is life, life, and more life. Amen. In every aspect of our lives, the very same life that God gave Jesus. And guys, if, if we're not excited about this, do you know what this tells me? These Ephesians prayers, uh, Ephesians 1, 17 through 21, we need to be praying this over ourselves and over our families every single day because we've got to know We've got to know the hope to which we're called. We've got to know the unlimited, surpassing greatness of the power that is to us and for us and through us who believe. You know, when Jesus was uh, on the earth and he was talking to the disciples and he said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It is to be said of the body of Christ, If you've seen me, You've seen Jesus. We are to be the exact replication, the exact person. See, we 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 have it in our in our thinking that we're that we're just wormy and kind of pathetic, and that God is just kind of just kind of doing this and putting us behind Him, you know, in front of the devil, and just saying, "I just leave the the puny thing alone." You know, and him just tapping on us and, and we'll, uh, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. And we have this mentality that we're trying to live our lives from down under such crap and just looking up, oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. When he said God himself abides on the inside of you. <clears throat> the same power and the same life that God infused into Jesus when he raised him from the dead. And he raised him from the dead after having every one of your sins, after ever having every one of my sins, after having every bit of the curse, every sickness, every disease, every foul thing that is known to man because of sin, God raised him up and infused him with life. And that same life abides on the inside of you. And so let it be said of us. Let it be said of the body of Christ. Let it be said of beyond church. If you've seen me, you've seen the Son. 
Amen. The same power. Lord, open our eyes. The spirit of wisdom and revelation flood the eyes of our heart with light so that we can know and understand the hope to which we're called. So that we can know and understand the greatness of your power that is at work within us and to us and for us. Glory to God. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we just honor you tonight. We honor you tonight. We love you. We magnify you. You have our heart, Lord. You have our heart. And so we just, we worship you and we honor you, Lord, as we bring our tithes and offerings into your house tonight. And we say, Father, use every dollar, use every cent to reach people to bring you glory, Lord, to magnify you, to expand your kingdom, to do all that is in your heart to do through us in this place, in Alma, Arkansas, through Beyond Church. And we bless you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. We love you. Hey, God is in you. God is in you. The life of God. Hallelujah. That's right, Miss Janice. The life of God. Another lady who I, I have just witnessed. I mean, uh, a hearer and a doer. A hearer and a doer. A hearer and a doer. Uh, she, hears, she heard the word. She hears the word. She does the word. And just exponential growth. You can say amen to that, can't you, Miss Janice? Yes. Yes, amen, amen, amen. Uh, yeah, God's in you. With the words of your mouth, create your future. With the words of your mouth, create your future. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. There is nothing the, a confession that I make over our family all the time. The law of the spirit of life has set us free from lack, poverty, sin, sickness, disease, strife, envy, and glory to God. The law of the spirit of life rules and reigns and governs every aspect of our lives. Life, life, and more life. We get this in us <clears throat> and we saw guys oh where was I going uh, we saw this and we start saying with our mouth what God says about us and then you know everywhere we go and the people that we meet what do we what do we give to them the life of God the life of God the life of God amen amen hey we love you guys and we will see you on 